The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway Chapter 1. The Old Man The old man fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, but eighty-four days had elapsed and he hadn't caught a single fish. The boy had accompanied him during the first forty days, but had left after that. The boy's parents had concluded that the old man was not very lucky. The boy had been ordered off to another boat that managed to catch as many as three good fish in the first week itself. But the boy was very sad. He saw the old man come in empty-handed every day without catching a single fish. The boy always wanted to help the old man carry the coiled lines, the gaff, the harpoon and the sail attached to the mast. The sail was worn out and patched with flour sacks and when furled resembled the flag of eternal loss. The old man was thin and haggard, and deep wrinkles were etched on the back of his neck. His cheeks were brown thanks to the constant exposure to the sun over the tropical sea. The brown blotches ran all over his face, and his hands were rough and scarred due to the cords he pulled to tackle heavy fish. But none of the scars were fresh. In fact, these scars were as old as abrasions in a desert where there were no fish available. Everything about the old man was old, with the sole exception of his eyes. His eyes resembled the colour of the sea and were joyous and unconquered. Santiago, the boy said to the old man as they climbed the bank from where they would pull up the skiff. I could accompany you again as we've made some money. The boy had learned how to fish from the old man and loved him dearly. No, the old man insisted. You are with a lucky boat. You should stay with it. But don't you recall how you didn't catch a single fish for 87 days, and then how we caught big ones every day for three weeks at a stretch? The boy asked. I do, the old man replied. I am also aware that you did not leave me because you were not confident. It was Papa who made me leave. I am just a boy and I must do as he says. I know, it's the right thing to do. He doesn't have a lot of faith. No, he doesn't, the old man replied. But we do, don't we? Yes, we do, the boy replied. Can I offer you a beer at the terrace? he asked. We can take this stuff home later. Of course, it is between fishermen. They sat at the terrace together as many fishermen who passed by made fun of the old man. But the old man was not angry. There were a few old fishermen who looked at him with pity, but they were polite enough not to display their true feelings. Instead, they spoke to the old man cordially about the movements and the current and the depths of the sea. They spoke about the good weather that had been constant for some time now and what they had witnessed at sea. The fishermen, who had been lucky at sea that day, had already come ashore. They had slaughtered the marlin they had managed to catch and carried them out of the boats after laying them across two planks. Two fishermen walked unsteadily at each end of the plank, carrying the heavy fish from the boat to the fish house. There, they would wait for the ice truck that would transport the dead fish all the way to Havana, the capital of Cuba. Chapter 2 On the Terrace The fishermen, who had managed to capture sharks and carried them to the shark factory located on the other side of the cove. Here, the sharks were elevated on a block and tackled, with their livers removed from their bodies. Their fins were cut off, their hides skinned out, and their flesh was cut into thin strips so they could be salted for preservation. Usually, a smell emanated from the shark factory all the way to the harbour when the wind blew eastward. But today, the wind had moved northward and had dropped suddenly. As a result, there was only the faint smell in the air. The terrace where the old man and the boy were seated was pleasant and sunny. The old man was holding his mug of beer and reminiscing about his youth. Santiago, the boy said, may I go out and fetch some sardines for you so you can enjoy them tomorrow? No, the old man replied. You go and play baseball. I can still row the boat. Rogelio will throw the net. But I would really like to do that, the boy insisted. I would like to help you in some way, as I cannot fish with you any more. Well, you brought me a beer, didn't you? The old man replied. You are a man now. Do you remember how old I was when I first accompanied you on your boat? The boy asked. You were five years old, the man replied. You almost died when I brought in that huge fish and nearly destroyed the boat. Do you remember? Yes, I remember, the boy replied. I remember him slapping and banging his tail. 
I remember the thwart breaking and the noise the clubbing made. I remember how you threw me into the bow where the wet coiled lines were. I felt the whole boat shaking after that as you clubbed the giant fish as if a tree were being felled. I remember the sweet smell of blood all over me. Do you really remember all of that? Or did I tell you that story? The old man asked. I remember everything that happened since we met for the first time, the boy replied. The old man looked at the boy lovingly. I'd take you out and risk it if you were my boy, he replied. But the truth is that you are your father and mother's boy, and you have found a lucky boat. Can I get you the sardines? The boy requested again. I know a place where I can get four baits as well. I still have the ones I use today, the old man replied. I have salted them and put them in the box. I'll get you four fresh ones, the boy insisted. Get me one then, the old man stated, not wanting to dampen the boy's enthusiasm. He realised that he had never lost possession of his hope and confidence. But now, it seemed that they were on the rise just like the sea breeze in full flow. I'll get you two, the boy stated. All right, the old man agreed. Two it is. Are you sure you didn't steal them? he asked. I would have stolen them for you, the boy replied, but I bought these. Thank you, the old man said. The old man was also a simple man. He did not think about how and when he had become so humble, but he knew that he was, just like he knew that his humility did not shame him in any way and that it did not hurt his pride. It will be a good day tomorrow with this current, the old man declared. Where are you headed tomorrow? the boy inquired. I'm only going so far out that I can return when the wind changes course. That's why I'll be out before dawn, the old man replied. I'll try to make him go far out too, the boy stated. That way, if you hook a really big fish, we can come and help you. He does not like to fish so far out, the old man said. True, the boy said, but I shall spot something that he cannot see like a bird at work, and I will make him come far out chasing dolphins. Are his eyes so bad? the old man asked. Yes, he is almost blind, the boy declared. That is a bit strange, as he never went turtling the old man stated. That is what kills the eyes. But your eyes are good, despite the fact that you went turtling for years off the Mosquito Coast, the boy protested. I am a strange old man, the old man replied. But are you strong enough now to catch a really big fish? the boy inquired. Yes, I think. Besides, I know many tricks, the old man said. I think we should carry the stuff home, the boy said. Then I can get the cast net and get those sardines for you. The old man and the boy picked up the fishing gear from the boat. The boy carried the wooden box that contained the brown lines that were coiled and braided thickly. He also carried the harpoon with its shaft and the gaff. The old man hoisted the mast over his shoulders. They did not carry the box which had the baits in it, but left it under the skiff's stern. It rested there along with the club that was used to overcome the big fish when they were caught. No one would steal anything from the old man's boat, but it was best not to take chances with the sail and the heavy lines in order to protect them from the dew. The old man was certain that none of the locals would steal from him, but then again, leaving behind a gaff and a harpoon on a boat gave birth to unnecessary temptation. Chapter 3. The Shack The old man and the boy walked together to reach the shack where the old man lived. They entered through the open door. The old man rested the mast with the sail wrapped around it against the wall and the boy placed the box and the other stuff beside it. The mast was almost as long as the only room in the shack. The shack had been constructed out of the hardened bud shields of the royal palm known as the guano. Inside there was a bed, a table and a chair. A small space had also been created on the dirt floor where one could cook with charcoal. The brown walls of the shack had been made up of the levelled, strong, fibred guano leaves that overlapped each other. The walls featured two pictures that served as the only decorations in the shack. The first was a colour picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the second was the Virgin of Coba. These two pictures were his wife's treasures, and his wife's photograph had adorned the wall once, but he had decided to take down the tinted photograph, as looking at it made him feel very lonely. Now it rested on a shelf in the corner of the room beneath his clean shirt. Do you have anything to eat? The boy inquired. There's a pot of yellow rice with some fish, 
Do you want some of that? The old man asked. No, I will eat at home. Do you want me to get a fire going? No, I shall light one later, the old man said, and added, I could also eat this rice cold. Can I take the cast net? The boy asked politely. Yes, of course, the old man replied. Actually, there was no cast net in the shack, and the boy clearly remembered that it had been sold off a long time ago. But the old man and the boy went through this pretense every day. The boy was also aware that there was no pot of yellow rice and fish in the shack. I think 85 is a lucky number, the old man declared. Wouldn't you like to see me bring in a catch that weighs over a thousand pounds? I think I'll take the cast net and go fetch the sardines, the boy said. Would you like to sit by the door in the sun? The old man nodded. Yes, I shall read about the baseball in yesterday's paper, he replied. The boy was unsure if the old man was making up the stuff about yesterday's newspaper as well, but he realised this was the truth when the old man brought it out from under his bed. Perico gave it to me at the bodega. The old man explained how he had come to acquire the newspaper. I'll return with the sardines later, the boy said. I shall keep yours and mine together on ice, and then we can share them in the morning. You can tell me all about the baseball when I return. There is no way the Yankees can lose, the old man predicted. But I'm worried about the Indians of Cleveland, the boy confessed. They have the great DiMaggio, the old man said assuringly. Actually, both the Tigers of Detroit and the Indians of Cleveland scare me, the boy said. Soon you'll be scared of the Reds of Cincinnati and the White Sox of Chicago as well, the old man retorted. Study about the baseball and let me know about it when I return, the boy said. Tomorrow is the 85th day, the old man declared. Will it be a good idea to purchase the terminal of the lottery with an 85? he asked. <laughs> we could do that, the boy agreed. But what happens to the 87 of your great record? he asked. It cannot happen twice, the old man replied doubtfully. Will you be able to get an 85? I can always order one, the boy replied. It costs two dollars and a half for one sheet, the old man said. Who will lend that to us? I can always borrow that kind of money. It's easy, the boy said. I think even I can, the man said, but I prefer not to, as at first you borrow and then you beg. Try and stay warm, old man, the boy urged. Do not forget that we are in the month of September. It is the month when the big fish arrive, the old man declared. Almost anyone can be a fisherman in the month of May. I think I'll go and get those sardines now, the boy said. Chapter 4. Dreams The old man was asleep in his chair when the boy returned at sundown. The boy covered the old man with an old army blanket that he took from the bread. He spread the blanket on the old man's shoulders. The old man's shoulders were a little odd. They were still very strong, though they were very old. The neck was powerful as well, and the boy noticed that the creases were not so prominent now. The old man was asleep with his head slumped forward. His shirt was as ancient as his sail, and had been patched many times. The sun had ensured that the patches had faded away and had lost all their colour. Now they had been reduced to different shades instead. His head was very old, and now that the old man was asleep, there were no signs to indicate that he was alive. The newspaper lay sprawled across his lap and was prevented from being blown away by the breeze due to the old man's arm that stubbornly pinned it down. The old man had no shoes on. The boy left him, but when he returned again, the old man was still asleep. Wake up, the boy whispered as he put his hand on the old man's knee. The old man opened his eyes, and for a moment it appeared that he was returning from somewhere very far away. Then he smiled at the boy. What do you have there? he asked the boy. I've brought supper. Let's eat. I'm not that hungry, the old man replied. But you must eat, the boy insisted. You can't fish all day and starve. The old man rose from his chair, picked up the newspaper and started folding it. Then he began folding the blanket. Cover yourself with the blanket, the boy said to the old man. You shall never fish without eating as long as I am alive. You should live a long and healthy life, the old man stated. What is there to eat? he inquired. Rice and black beans, the boy replied. There are also some fried bananas and stew. The boy had got the food in a two-decker metal container from the terrace. He also carried two sets of knives and forks in his pocket, with a paper napkin wrapped around each set. Who gave you the food? the old man asked. The owner, Martin, 
the boy replied. I must thank him, the old man said. I've already done so, the boy replied. You don't need to thank him again. I'll gift him the belly meat of a big fish, the old man declared. Hasn't he sent food for us more than once? he asked. Yes, he has. He has been very kind to us, the old man said. I must give him something more than the belly meat of a big fish. He's also sent two beers for us, the boy said. I like beers and cans the best, the old man said. I know that, the boy said. But this is bottled beer, called Hatchui beer. I'll return the bottles to him. That's very considerate of you, the old man said. Should we begin our meal now? That's what I've been asking you to do, the boy said gently. I didn't want to open the container till you were ready to eat. I'm ready to eat now, the old man stated. I just needed time to wash up. But where did you wash up? the boy thought. The only water supply in the village was two streets away. I must make sure that he has water here to wash up, the boy decided. I must also ensure that he has soap and a good towel. And why have I been so thoughtless? He also needs a new shirt, a winter jacket, and shoes and a blanket. This stew is great to taste, the old man commented. Tell me what you read about the baseball, the boy demanded. The Yankees are on top of the American League, just as I had mentioned, the old man happily replied. But they lost today, the boy informed him. That doesn't mean a thing, the old man said dismissively. The great DiMaggio is back in form again. But there are other players in the team, the boy protested. Of course there are, the old man said. But DiMaggio makes the difference in the team. In the other league that exists between Brooklyn and Philadelphia, I must pick Brooklyn. But then again, I am reminded of Dick Sizzler's performance and the great drives in the old park. Yes, the boy agreed. I've never seen anything quite like that. He hits the longest ball I've ever seen. Do you recall the days when he used to visit the terrace? The old man asked. I wanted to take him fishing, but I was too shy to ask him. Then I told you to ask him, and you were shy as well. I know what you are saying, the boy said with the regret. It was a big mistake on our part. He might have gone fishing with us, for all you know. That memory would have remained with us forever. Well, I'd like to take the great DiMaggio fishing, the old man declared. I've heard that his father was a fisherman. It is quite possible that he was as poor as us once. He would surely understand. The father of the great Dick Sizzler was hardly a poor man, though, the boy informed the old man. The father was playing in the big league when he was my age. Well, when I was your age, I was before the mast on a square rigged ship that was bound for Africa. At your age, I saw lions on the beaches in the evening, the old man stated. Yes, I know, the boy said. You've told me about that before. Do you want to talk about Africa or baseball? The old man asked. Baseball! The boy replied, tell me about the great John J. McGraw now, he requested. Well, he used to visit the terrace too in the good old days, the old man said. But he was a rough man and spoke rather rudely. He was tough to handle, especially when he was drinking. He was passionate about horses as well as baseball. He used to carry lists about horses in his pocket all the time and was often overheard speaking the names of horses on the telephone. But he was a great manager, wasn't he? The boy inquired. In fact, my father thinks that he was the greatest manager that ever lived. That was only because he used some. To... That was only because he used to come here often. The old man reasoned. If Durocher had kept coming here every year, your father would have thought him to be the greatest manager instead. But who is the greatest manager according to you? The boy asked. Luke or Mike Gonzalez? They are equal, I think. The old man said. And are you the best fisherman? The boy asked. No, there are others I know who are far better, the old man replied. Que va, the boy said. I know many good fishermen, and I also know some great ones. And then there is only you. Thank you, the old man said. You make me happy, but I hope that a great fish does not come along to prove you wrong. There is no such great fish if you claim to be as strong as you do, the boy challenged. I might not be as strong as I think, the old man confessed. But what I have are many tricks up my sleeve and great determination. It is time for you to go to bed now so that you are fresh in the morning, the boy said. I shall take these things back to the terrace. Good night, said the old man. I shall wake you up in the morning. Yes, you are my alarm clock, the boy said. Age is my alarm clock, the old man said, and then asked, 
Why is it that old men wake up so early in the morning? Is it a desire to live one day longer? I have no idea, the boy replied. All that I know is that young boys sleep hard and late. I'll wake you up on time, the old man said. I do not like it if he wakes me, the boy explained. It is as if he were superior to me. I understand, the old man replied. Good night, old man, the boy said. Sleep well. The boy left, and the old man undressed in the dark. He went to bed in the darkness, using the trousers that he had worn as a pillow, by rolling them up in a bundle and placing a newspaper inside them. Then he rolled inside the blanket to sleep in the older newspapers that covered the springs of his bed. In a few minutes, the old man was asleep. He dreamt of Africa. He had seen as a little boy. He saw the long golden beaches as well as the white beaches. The beaches were so white that they tended to hurt your eyes. He dreamt of the high capes and the great brown mountains. Every night in his dreams he was transported to that African coast where he heard the surf roar, where he saw the native boats riding the surf to come across the shore. He could also smell the tar of the deck. In the mornings, when he woke up, he could breathe in the smell of Africa brought about by the land breezes at dawn. Normally, he could smell the land breezes when he woke up and dressed to go and wake the boy. But this particular night, the smell of the land breezes seemed to appear sooner than expected. The old man was aware that it was still too early in his dream and kept on dreaming. He saw the white peaks of the islands as they ascended from within the sea, and then he dreamed about the various harbours and the roadsteads of the Canary Islands. The old man had stopped dreaming about storms, women, or any great happenings. He no longer dreamed about the fish, battles, bouts of strength, or even his wife. The only things he dreamed about now were different places and the lions on the beach. When the lions frolicked and played like kittens in the dusk, he was as loved the lions as much as he loved the boy. But the old man never dreamed about the boy. Chapter 5 Going Fishing the old man woke up and stared at the moon through the open door. He unrolled his trousers and put them on. He relieved himself outside the shack and then walked up the road to wake the boy. The morning cold made the old man shiver, but he was aware that he would soon be warm and then he would be off on his boat. The door of the boy's house was unlocked and the old man was barefoot and walked in quietly. He found the boy asleep in a cot in the first room. The old man could see him as the light from the dying moon fell on the boy's face. The old man held one foot of the boy gently and did not loosen his grip till the boy was awake. The boy looked at him and the old man nodded. The boy picked up his trousers lying on the chair by the bed and put them on. The old man went outside the house and was followed by the boy who still looked sleepy. I am sorry, the old man apologised as he put an arm across the boy's shoulders. Que va, the boy replied. It is what a man must do. The two of them walked down the road towards the old man's shack. Along the way, they saw many barefooted men moving about in the dark. They were all carrying the masts of their boats. The boy collected the harpoon and the gaff, along with the rolls of line in the basket, as soon as they had reached the shack. The old man hoisted the mast with the furled sail over his shoulders and carried it. Do you want some coffee? the boy asked. We'll get some after we put the gear in the boat, the old man replied. They had coffee later at an early morning place serving fishermen. Coffee was served in condensed milk cans. Did you sleep well, old man? the boy inquired. The coffee had managed to awaken him partially. I slept very well, Manolin, the old man replied. I feel very confident today. I feel the same, the boy stated. I'll fetch our sardines now, as well as your fresh baits. You know he is different. He never wants anyone else to carry his gear and prefers to do it himself. Well, we are different, the old man replied. Don't you remember that I let you carry my gear when you were five years old? Yes, the boy said. Have another coffee and I'll be right back. We have credit here, so don't worry. The boy walked barefoot on the coral rocks toward the ice house where the baits were stored. The old man sipped his coffee slowly. He knew that it was all the food and drink that he would consume all day. He had stopped carrying lunch for a long time now, as eating simply bored him. All that he needed for the entire day was a bottle of water which he had stashed away in the bow of the skiff. The boy returned soon, carrying the sardines and the baits in the newspaper wrapping. The two walked down the trail that led to the skiff. Then they lifted the skiff together and slid her into the water. Good luck, old man, the boy said. Good luck, the old man replied. 
Chapter 6. The Sea. The old man attached the rope lashings of the oars to the thole pins and then leaned forward against the motion of the oar blades in the water. Then he began rowing his boat out of the harbour into the darkness. The old man could not see the boats from the other beaches that were sailing out to sea. The moon was still below the hills. But he could hear the distinct dip and push of the oars. He would hear someone talking in a boat every now and then, but most fishermen preferred to be silent, and the oars did all the talking as they splashed in the waters. As soon as the boats had emerged from the mouth of the harbour, they sprang out into the vast ocean where each fisherman hoped to find a fish. As soon as the boats had emerged from the mouth of the harbour, they sprang out into the vast ocean where each fisherman hoped to find fish. The old man had decided beforehand that he would be heading far out this time, and he had left the land far behind him and was greeted by the clean early morning smell of the ocean. He witnessed the phosphorescence of the gulf weed floating in the water as he reached the area that was named the Great Well by the fishermen. This was because there was a sudden depth of 700 fathoms here where all types of fish gathered on account of the swirl created by the current against the steep walls of the ocean floor. One could find a lot of shrimp and bait here as well as schools of squid in the deepest holes. These fish appear near the surface during the night and all the fish had gathered here preyed on them. The old man could sense the morning approach even as he rowed his boat in the dark. He heard the trembling of the flying fish as they jumped out of the water and he heard the hissing noises made by their rigid set of wings as they flew away in the dark. The old man loved the flying fish as he considered them his best friends of the ocean. He was in a way sympathetic towards the birds, especially the small, fragile, dark terns that were always flying, as if looking for something but failing each time to find whatever they were flying for. These birds lead a difficult life, a life that is harder than us humans with the exception of thieving birds and the heavier, stronger ones, of course, he thought. Why did they create such fine, fragile birds such as sea swallows when the sea can be so cruel to them? The sea is kind and extraordinary and beautiful at first sight, but the ocean can be so cruel sometimes that it becomes evident that the flying birds that fly, dip and hunt with their sad, shrill voices are not cut out for a life at sea. To the old man, the sea was always la mar, which is what the Spanish, who love the sea, call her. There are times when people who love the sea also say hateful things about her, but these things are said by men as if the sea was a woman, a few of the younger fishermen used boys as floats for their lines and rowed motorboats, which they had purchased with shark liver money when shark hunting had been big. These fishermen addressed the sea as masculine form of lama. They talked about the sea as a sort of contestant, place or even an enemy. But for the old man, the sea was always a woman. He would either granted or held back great favours. If the sea engaged in cruel and wild activity, it was only because she had no control over these acts. Just as the moon affected a woman and controlled her actions, it was the same for the sea. The old man was rowing his boat steadily, and navigation didn't pose a major problem as he was maintaining a perfect speed. The surface of the ocean was calm and flat with the exception of an occasional current. The old man was content to let the current do a third of his job. When light broke out, the old man was satisfied as he had covered more distance than he had intended to at this hour. He reflected that he had fished in the deep wells for a week and yielded nothing at all. Today I shall find out where the schools of Benita and Albacore are and hopefully catch a big fish, he resolved. Chapter 7. Creatures of the Sea Before dawn the old man's baits were down. The first was down at a depth of 40 fathoms, the second at 75, and the third and fourth at 100 and a 125 fathoms. Each bait was suspended head first with the hook's shank penetrating the bait fish by being tied and sewed into it. The projection of the hook was covered with fresh sardines, and each sardine was hooked through the eyes of a bait fish, creating a sort of garland. The boy had given him two small tuners or albacores, which were suspended from the deepest lines. He had put a used big blue runner and a yellow jack on the other baits that were in good condition. The old man was well equipped with his fishing gear too. His line was as thick as a big pencil and was looped into a green sapped stick. A pull or even a mere touch on the bait ensured that the stick dipped into the water. Each line had two 40 fathom coils that could be easily attached to spare coils. 
This enabled over 300 fathoms of line to catch fish in the depths of the sea. The old man watched the dip of the three sticks lowered from the side of the skiff. He rowed slowly to keep the line straight and at their required depths. It was already brightening up and he knew that the sun would rise soon. He could spot the other boats now as the sun slowly rose. Then the sun became brighter and the glare stung his eyes. He rowed the boat, taking care not to stare at the sun and watched the lines that went deep into the water instead. The old man kept his line straighter than any other fisherman so that at each level one of his baits awaited any of the fish that passed there. There were other fishermen who let them drift with the current, with the result that the lines were at a depth of sixty fathoms, when the fishermen thought they were at a hundred. The old man wondered why his luck eluded him, even though he was so meticulous with his fishing. But every day was a brand new day. Maybe today his luck would change. But it was better to be precise, because when Lady Luck finally arrived, he would be ready. The sun had gone up two hours higher now, and did not hurt his eyes so much. He could see only three boats now, and they were further away and inshore. The sun has hurt my eyes every morning throughout my life, the old man thought. Yet, there is nothing wrong with my eyesight. My eyes are still sharp. I can see right through the darkness in the evening when my eyes are sharper, but they do hurt a little in the morning. Suddenly, he spotted a man of war bird circling in the sky. The bird dropped, then rose into the sky again. The old man knew at once that the bird had found something. He rowed unhurriedly where the bird had dived. He saw the bird dive again and spotted a flying fish jump out of the water. Big dolphin, the old man said aloud. He immediately fetched a small line from under the bow with a wire leader and a medium-sized hook. He used one of the sardines to bait and then dropped it on the side of the skiff baited another line and left it coiled in the bow. Then he rowed the boat and watched the bird again who was following the flying fish now. He observed a slight bulge in the water and realised that the big dolphins were following the escaping fish. The dolphins were moving speedily in the water below the flying fish. As soon as the fish dropped, the dolphins dived underwater again. It's a big school of dolphins, the old man said to himself. But the bird has little chance with the flying fish as they are too fast. The dolphins were moving so speedily that the old man thought he would lose them, but he was optimistic about his chances. Maybe I can pick up a stray dolphin or catch a big fish close to them, he thought. The clouds that appeared over land resembled mountains and the coast was long, green line backed by the grey-blue hills. The dark blue water was so dark that it was purplish. The old man was happy to see a lot of plankton in the water, as it indicated the availability of plenty of fish. The strange light that the sun reflected in the waters promised good weather, just like the shape of the clouds. But the bird was almost out of his line of vision, and the surface of the water did not show any more movement with the exception of some yellow sargasso weed and the purple bladder of a Portuguese man-of-war that floated happily beside his boat. He saw it turn on its side and right itself with its dangerous purple filaments, following it in the water a yard behind. Agua mala, the old man exclaimed, and then swore at the Portuguese man of war as he watched the tiny fish following the animal. The fish had turned purple due to the training filaments and were immune to the poison, but the men were not, and sometimes these filaments would stick to a line and cause welts and sores on the old man's hands, just like poison ivy when it was working on a fish. But the poisoning caused by the agua mala struck instantly. The bubbles they caused in the water were lovely, but these animals were the most deceptive in the sea, and nothing pleased the old man more than seeing a big sea turtle devour them. The turtles would approach the animal from the front and shut its eyes. Then they would eat it whole along with the filaments. The old man loved the green turtles and the hawksbill turtles for their grace, value and speed. He was a little contemptuous of the large, stupid, yellow loggerheads that looked strange when they mated and funny when they ate the Portuguese men of war with their eyes shut. The old man was fond of eating the white turtle eggs, as they gave him strength. He also drank a cup of shark liver oil every day. Most fishermen hated the taste, but the old man knew it was good for his eyes as well as colds and grips. Having made trips on the turtle boats for many years, the old man sympathised with the turtles. Many people were cruel to them, and it pained the old man that the turtle's heart beat for hours, even after it was killed and cut up. I have a heart like a turtle too, the old man thought. Even my hands and feet are like theirs. Chapter 8. The Marlin The old man looked up to see that the bird had returned and was circling in the air again. 
He spotted a fish, the old man exclaimed. A small tuna rose in the air and then dived back into the water. Another followed it, and soon there were many fish jumping up and falling back into the water. They were jumping after the bait. I shall get them if they don't move very fast, he concluded, as the bird dipped into the water. That bird is very helpful, the old man thought. He dropped his oars suddenly and he felt the tug of a fish on his line. He held the line strongly and tried to pull in the fish. He could see the blue-black of the fish in the water and its golden sides as he reeled it in. The fish landed on the boat with a thud and thrashed about with its tail. The old man hit the fish on the head to relieve it of its suffering. It's an albacore, weighing about ten pounds, he said aloud. He'll make the perfect bait. It escaped his memory when he had begun talking to himself. In the old days he had sung when he was alone. He had possibly started talking to himself after the boy had left, but he was not sure. When the boy had accompanied him, they had never spoken to each other unless it was absolutely essential. The conversation happened only at night, or if they experienced a storm or bad weather. It was considered a good principle not to talk without reason at sea, and the old man had always followed and respected this golden rule. But now he always thought aloud when alone, because no one would be irritated if he did so. If other fishermen heard me talk aloud, they would probably think I'm mad. But since I'm not, I really don't care, he declared. He thought about the rich fishermen possessing radios that broadcast the latest baseball news. This is hardly time to think about baseball, he thought. Instead, it's time to think about just one thing, the thing I was born for. There must be a big fish near that school. I managed to catch only a small one from the feeding albacore. Is it because the fish are travelling too fast for me? Or is there something in the weather that I'm unaware of? He wondered. The green of the shore could not be sighted now, and only the tops of the blue hills were visible. These tops looked white, as if they were snow-covered, and the clouds above resembled high mountains of snow. The light created prisms on the dark sea, and it was very hot due to the high sun. The old man felt the heat behind his neck and the sweat trickling down his spine as he rode. He thought about drifting and taking a nap. He would tie a bit of line around his toe to wake him up. But, eventually, he decided against it. No, today is the 85th day, and I should spend the day fishing well. Suddenly, as he watched his lines, he saw a green stick dip in the water. Yes, he exclaimed, as he gripped the line softly between his thumb and forefinger of his right hand. But he didn't feel any weight or strain. Then there was a soft pull, and he knew exactly what it was. It was a marlin, about a hundred fathoms down, eating the sardines covering the point and shank of the hook. The old man held the line gently with his left hand and released it from the stick. He let it run through his fingers so that the fish would not feel any tension. The marlin must be really big, he thought, to be so far out at this time of year. Please eat the sardines, fish, he urged. They are so fresh, and they have been sent down especially for you, so please eat them. He experienced a slight pull and then a stronger one to indicate that a particular sardine's head must have been tough to disengage from the hook. Then there was nothing at all. Come on, the old man urged again. Turn around and smell them. Those sardines are tasty. Eat them first, and then you can have a lovely tuna. Don't be shy, fish. Eat them. He waited patiently for a while, as he watched the other lines for the fish might have gone down there. Then he felt another soft pull. Please let him take it, God, the old man said aloud. But it seemed that the fish had left. He couldn't have left, the old man exclaimed. He's probably taking a turn and will return. Maybe he remembers about being hooked before this. But the old man was happy as he felt another pull. Then he felt the fierce tugging from something really heavy and hard. He let the line slip down as he loosened the first of the two reserve coils. But he could still feel the weight of the fish. It's a monster, he exclaimed. He's got the bait sideways in his mouth and is trying to run away with it. He should turn around and swallow it soon, the old man hoped desperately. He was aware that such a huge fish might escape. The weight increased and he released more of the line as he could feel the fish going straight down. He's taken the bait, the old man exclaimed. I'll let him eat it now. Chapter 9. The Battle Begins the old man let the line slip through his fingers as he attached the ends of the two reserve coils to those of the next line with his left hand. He was totally ready for the fight now, as apart from the coil he was using, he had a backdrop of three forty fathoms of extra coil. Eat some more, he urged the fish. Eat it well enough so that the sharp hook enters your heart and kills you. 
Then you can come up and allow me to put the harpoons in you. The old man struck forcefully with both hands. He gained one yard of line and struck repeatedly as he swung with each arm alternately on the cord. He used all the strength in his arms and also his body weight to bring the fish in, but it was useless. The fish moved away from him and the old man couldn't bring him in, though his line was perfect for the heavy fish. The fish dragged the boat away towards the northwest. The other baits were abandoned in the water and there was nothing the old man could do about it. It would have been easier if the boy had been with me, the old man said. I'm being towed away by this fish instead of the other way round. If I decrease the line, he could break it. I must give him all the line and try to hold him. I am lucky he is moving ahead and isn't going down, he thought. But what should I do if he decides to head down? I'm sure I can do a lot of things, but he can't go on like this forever. He must die soon. But the fish kept swimming for four hours, towing the skiff and frustrating the old man who still fought the fish with the line around his back. I hooked him at noon, he thought. I still haven't seen him. The straw hat that the old man had on was cutting into his forehead now. He was thirsty and carefully reached for his water bottle by getting down on his knees so he didn't jerk the line. He sipped some water and tried not to think too much. He could not see any land behind him now. That is not a problem, he thought. The lights from Havana will guide me home. There are two more hours before sunset, and I should catch him before that. If that doesn't happen, he should come up with the moon. If not, with the sunrise. I am still strong enough, and he has the hook in his mouth, and not me. He is a very strong fish to pull me away like this, the old man thought admiringly. But I wish I could see him just once to know what I'm fighting. Not once did the fish alter his course or direction that entire night as the old man gazed from the stars. After sunset, it started getting colder, and the old man's sweat dried to his body. He wrapped himself with the sack that covered the bait box. He tied it around his neck so that it fell over his back, and he adjusted it so that it went under the line across his shoulders. The sack now served to cushion the line, and the old man was much more comfortable. They were moving slowly as the boat headed eastward. He wondered how the baseball matches went off on the leagues that day, and said aloud, I wish the boy was here with me. He could have seen this and also helped me out. He thought about how no one should be alone when they are old, but then that couldn't be helped. He saw two paupers at night rolling and blowing near the boat. The old man could differentiate between the blowing of the male and the sighing blow the female made. They are our brothers, like the flying fish, he thought. They play, joke, and love each other. The old man started to feel sympathetic towards the fish he had hooked as well. The fish is old, wise, and strong. Never have I hooked such a strange fish. Perhaps he is too sensible to jump, as he could finish me if he does so. Maybe he has been hooked so many times that he knows how to fight. He is incapable of knowing that he is up against only one man, that too an old man. But I wonder how much his flesh would fetch in the market. He took the bait like a male, and he fights as a male should without panicking. Is he working to a plan, or is he a desperado just like me? He wondered. He recalled the time that he had hooked the female of a marlin pair. As a rule, the male marlin always let the female feed first, and so he had hooked the female. The tired female gave up the fight after a while, but the loyal male never deserted her. He swam by her side, crossing the line and going round in circles near the surface. The old man had been scared that he would cut the line with his tail, which was sharp as a knife and as big. When the old man had gaffed the female and clubbed her after pulling her over, the male had stayed near the boat. Then the male had jumped high into the air to get a last glimpse of his mate on the boat and had gone down. He was a beautiful sight with his lavender wings that were his pectoral fins spread out wide. The boy had been with the old man then, and both of them had experienced a strange sadness. Then they had both begged the pardon of the female Marlin before butchering her. Chapter 10 Missing the Boy I wish the boy was with me now, the old man exclaimed. Then he felt the power of the big fish again that dragged his boat away. We have been joined by fate since noon, he thought. His choice had been to stay in the dark waters away from all the traps and my choice was to go and find him. Now there is no one to help either of us. Maybe I shouldn't have become a fisherman. But then again, that was my destiny. The old man made a mental note of eating some tuna when it was dawn as he needed to regain his strength. 
but just before daylight, he sent something grab the bait behind him. He heard the sound of the stick breaking as the line began running out of the skiff's gunwale. He took out his sheath knife in the dark and cut the line by pressing it against the wood of the gunwale. Then he cut the other line closest to him and created loose ends of reserve coils. He worked expertly with one hand, with his foot on the coils to strengthen the knots. He had six reserve coils of line. Now they were all joined together. He also decided to cut away the 40 fathom bait and attach it to the reserve coils. He, however, regretted releasing the fish, who had just taken the bait before knowing what it was. He once again wished he had the boy with him. But you don't have him, he thought. You are all alone, and so you'd better work alone. It was tough to work in the dark, and once the fish pulled so suddenly that he fell flat on his face and cut himself below the eye. The blood ran down his cheek, but dried up before it could reach his chin. He managed to reach the bow and rested for a while. I'll stay with you till I'm a dead man, fish, he declared. I guess he'll stay with me till he's as dead as well. It was chilly now, and as dawn approached, the old man rubbed his body against the wood to keep warm. I can do this as long as he can, he thought. As the first rays of the sun fell, the old man realised that the fish was headed north. That meant the fish was going against the current and was still not tired. But the good news was that he was swimming at a lesser depth than before. Please don't let him jump. God, the old man prayed. I have enough line to tackle him now. He tried increasing the tension but discovered that the line was already stretched out fully and no more strain could be applied unless it break. Fish, I love you and respect you a lot, but I swear to kill you before the day ends, the old man pledged. A small bird known as a warbler flew low over the water. The old man saw that it was exhausted. The bird rested on the stern and then flew around the old man's head and finally rested on the line. How old are you? the old man asked the bird. Is this your first trip at sea? The bird stared at the old man and almost slipped on the line. Why are you so tired on a night that isn't windy? the old man asked. Then he thought about the hawks that ventured out to sea, but said nothing about that to the bird. He wouldn't understand him anyway, but would discover the ugly truth about hawks soon enough. Take some well-deserved rest, little bird, he said instead. Then take your chances, just like the fish, man and bird. The old man felt better when he talked, as his back was totally stiff and hurt badly. You can stay with me if you like, little bird. Just then the fish pulled violently, and the old man almost fell overboard. He saved himself in the nick of time by releasing some line and fell on the bow instead. The bird had flown away, as the line was disturbed, and the old man saw that his left hand was bleeding from the friction. I must concentrate on my work, and not get distracted, the old man decided. I must also eat some tuna to get back my strength. How could a fish pull me down like that? He wondered. I wish the boy was here, and I wish I had some salt, he said aloud. The old man shifted the weight of the line to his left shoulder and knelt carefully to wash his wounded hand in the sea. He held it down for a minute to wash away the blood. The fish has slowed me down, he thought later. He decided to eat the tuna quickly before the fish pulled again. As the old man ate, he realised that his wounded hand was cramping. This was worrying as he needed his working hand now. He rubbed the cramped hand against his trousers, but it would not open. The old man decided to let it open on its own without forcing it. He stared across the sea and realised that he was completely alone. He spotted a flight of wild ducks and knew that no man was ever alone at sea. He stared at the sky and saw the friendly cumulus sky shaped like ice cream. Well, fish, he said, at least I have better weather than you. The old man decided to fix his cramped hand and slapped it against his thighs repeatedly. Suddenly there was a pull on the line as it slanted upwards slowly. He's coming up, the old man exclaimed. The line rose slowly as the waters of the ocean ahead of the boat parted as the fish, the marlin, finally emerged from under the water. Chapter 11. The Marlin Reveals Himself The fish shone brightly in the sun as it emerged fully from the water. His head and back were dark purplish in colour and the stripes on his sides were light lavender. The sword resembled a baseball bat in length and was tapered like a rapier. Then the fish dived back into the water like an expert diver as the old man watched with the huge knife-like blade of his tail disappear and the line race out. He must be at least two feet longer than my boat, the old man exclaimed. He tried to keep the line from breaking with both hands as he observed that the fish was not panicking at all. 
The old man realised that if he did not slow down the fish, then he would soon break the line. I must persuade this great fish, he thought. It is up to me not to let him know his own strength and what he is capable of if he started running. If I were in his place, I would go full steam ahead till I broke the line. Thank God they don't possess as much intelligence as we who kill them, but they are more honourable and capable than us. The old man had encountered many a fish. He had witnessed plenty of them weighing more than a thousand pounds and had managed to catch two of them twice in his fishing career, but he had never been alone. But now he was completely alone, and neither could he sight land. Furthermore, he was battling the biggest fish he had ever seen and heard about, and to make things worse, he had an almost useless cramped hand. It will surely uncramp and help my right hand again, the old man hoped. It must do so, as my two hands and the fish are like three brothers. The fish had reduced his pace now and travelled slowly. I wonder why he jumped, the old man thought. Maybe he did that to display his size to me. I wish I could display the kind of man I am to him as well. But then he might see the cramped hand. Instead, let him assume that I'm more man than I actually am. For a moment, the old man wished that he could exchange places with the fish, so that he had all the advantages that the fish possessed, and was up against only intelligence and willpower. But he took the suffering silently, as the fish led him and his boat away slowly. Thankfully, his left hand was uncramped by noon. I've got bad news for you, fish he exclaimed. The old man suffered quite a bit, but was reluctant to admit it. Although I'm not a religious man, he declared, I shall say ten Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers so that I can catch this fish. I shall promise to embark on a pilgrimage to the Virgin de Cobra if I do so. The old man started to say his prayers, but he was so exhausted that he sometimes forgot the words. Then he would start reciting the prayer so quickly that the words appeared from his memory naturally. It is easier to say Hail Marys and Our Fathers, he discovered. The old man felt rejuvenated after he had said his prayers, but the truth was that his physical discomfort still existed and had, in fact, increased. He started flexing his fingers of his left hand in an attempt to bring some life back into it. The sun was hot, though a faint breeze provided some respite. The old man decided to rebait the little line, as he needed food in case he had to battle the fish for another night. Even his water supply was scarce. And I'll get is a dolphin in these waters, the old man thought. But he won't taste so bad if I eat him fresh. I wish I had a light to attract a flying fish aboard. I would have to cut him up and he would taste really nice in the raw. But I must conserve my energy now. God, I never thought he could be so huge, he exclaimed but I'll kill him eventually, despite his greatness and show of strength, the old man pledged. It might not be fair, but I'll show him what a man is capable of doing and coping up with. I had boasted to the boy that I was a strange old man, didn't I? Well, I must prove it now. The old man had proved himself again and again in the past, but when he faced a challenging situation like this, he totally forgot about the past and was keen to prove a point again. I wish the fish would sleep so I could sleep too and dream about the lions, the old man wished. Why do I dream only about the lions, he thought, and immediately reproached himself. Don't think too much, old man. Rest both your body and mind. He is working now, so you must work as less as you can. It was afternoon now as the boat commenced its slow and steady journey. The old man could visualise the great fish swimming underwater now that he had seen him once. I wonder how he sees in the dark so great a depth, he wondered. His eyes are big, and a horse can see in the dark with smaller eyes. Once I could see clearly in the dark, the old man reflected sadly. Not in total darkness, but just like a cat. His left hand was completely uncramped now, and he used both of his hands effortlessly to grip the line. If you are still not tired, you must be a really strange fish indeed, the old man exclaimed. Chapter 12. Memories of the Champion the old man was totally exhausted now and aware that night would soon set in. He tried to distract himself by thinking about other things, like the big leagues of baseball. He knew that the New York Yankees were playing the Detroit Tigers. This is the second day when I do not know about the baseball game results, he thought sadly. But I must have faith and finish the job at hand, just like the great DiMaggio. I must work hard and fight all the pain I'm experiencing as, as DiMaggio does to win baseball games despite having a bone spur. But then again, I'd rather exchange places with the beast from the sea, he confessed. 
But if sharks come, he stated as an afterthought, he stated as an afterthought, God help the two of us. The old man wondered if his idol, the great DiMaggio, would fight a fish as long as he had. Of course he would, the old man concluded. Wasn't DiMaggio a fisherman's son after all? But would the bone spur hurt him? Well, I don't know about that, he said to himself. I never had a bone spur. The old man tried to boost his confidence as the sun set. He recalled the time in a Casablanca tavern where he had arm wrestled with that big negro from Cienfuegos, who had been the dock's strongest man. They had battled one day and one night with their elbows placed on the table where a chalk line had been drawn. Their forearms had been propped up and their right hands been clasped tightly together as each of them had tried to force an arm of the other on the table. Bets had been placed furiously as people entered and exited the room. They had fought in the dim kerosene light of the room as darkness had descended and new referees were brought in to officiate every four hours as the old ones needed to sleep. Blood had dripped from under the nails of both the contestants as they had stared at each other. The betters had watched the proceedings seated on the high chairs set it against the walls, even as many left. The wooden walls of the room were painted a bright blue and the lamps had thrown their shadows on them. The negro shadow had been massive when compared to that of the old man and it had moved across the wall as a slight breeze and settled the lamps. But he had not been an old man then, he reflected. He had been Santiago El Campeon. The odds of the match had kept changing back and forth throughout the contest. The men had lit his cigarettes and fed the negro rum, and the negro, after having his drink, made a huge effort. He threw the old man off balance by nearly three inches, but the old man fought back brilliantly to bring his arm at level again with that of the negro. It was then that he had known that the negro, who was a great man and a great athlete, would not win the match. At dawn, when the betters were begging for a draw to be declared so that they could go home, the old man had gathered all his energy to force the hand of the negro up and down till it finally rested on the table and the negro had been beaten. The great arm wrestling match that had begun on Sunday morning had concluded on Monday morning. The betters had been anxious for the match to finish quickly as most of them had to go for work at the Havana Coal Company or had to report to the docks to unload sacks of sugar. But Santiago had finished the match before they had to report for work, and they were all relieved. He had been named the champion, and the name had stuck for a very long time. A return match had been fixed in the spring, but not a lot of money had been bet. It had been a walk in the park for Santiago, who had won easily, as the Negro's confidence had taken a beating after the first match. The old man had stopped arm wrestling a few matches after that. He had reasoned that it was simply not worth it any more as he could be anyone he wanted to if it mattered a lot to him. More importantly, his right hand needed to be in good shape so that he could continue fishing. He tried a few practice matches with his left hand, but sadly his left hand had always betrayed him. It never did what he asked it, and somehow he could not rely on it. The sun will bake and heal it soon enough, he thought. Unless it becomes very chilly at night, it should not cramp again. I wonder what lies in store for me tonight. He watched as an aeroplane flew overhead en route to Miami, its shadow scaring the school of flying fish in the water below. There must be a dolphin in this area, going by the amount of flying fish, the old man concluded. But he could not gain any line on his fish, and the line remained taut as the boat continued its languid movement. He watched the aeroplane till it disappeared from his line of vision. It must be really strange, sitting in an aeroplane, he thought. How does the sea look like from such a great height? One should be able to spot the fish if it isn't flying at a great height, I suppose. What I would like to do is fly really slowly at a height of 200 fathoms to spot the fish from up there. The old man declared, When I was up in the masthead of the turtle boats, I saw many things from that height, he reflected. The dolphins appeared greener, and I could see their purple spots, stripes, as well as their entire school as they swarm. But why do all the speedy fish of the dark current possess purple spots, stripes, and backs? I know that the dolphin looks greener as he is golden in colour, but why does he have purple stripes on his sides that are displayed as he rises to feed? Is it hunger, or is it the great speed that he travels that causes them? Chapter 13. Dolphin for Dinner The boat passed a large island composed entirely of sargassa weed just before darkness. The island bounced and moved, resembled a yellow blanket under which the ocean was making love. Suddenly, the old man discovered that his small lion had been taken by a dolphin. He spotted the dolphin when it flew in the air, displaying its beautiful golden body. It flapped wildly as it was airborne before diving back into the waters. 
It jumped repeatedly and fearfully as the old man slowly brought it in with the line. When the fish was aligned with the stern of the boat, moving desperately from side to side in an attempt to escape, the old man leaned over and picked up the dolphin. The dolphin gnawed at the hook with its sharp jaws and its tail beat the wooden floor of the skiff repeatedly. The old man silenced it with a few blows on the golden head with his club. The dolphin twitched for a while and lay still. The old man released the hook from the fish, baited the line with another sardine and threw it overboard. He returned to the bow to wash his left hand and wiped it on his trousers. Switching the heavy line from his right hand to his left, he washed his right hand in the sea. The sun went down just then and the old man noticed that the fish had slowed down considerably. He decided to tie the two oars together across the stern to slow down the fish further during the night. I'll gut the dolphin a little later so that his blood is preserved in the meat, the old man decided. I shan't disturb the fish too much at sunset as it is a tough time for all fish. Besides, the fish hasn't eaten anything since he took the bait. I, on the other hand, have eaten an entire bonito. It isn't fair. The fish is huge and needs a lot of food. So I'll eat the dorado tomorrow. Then he called the dolphin that. Perhaps I shall eat a bit of it when I clean it. It will be tougher to eat than the bonito, but then nothing in life is easy. How do you feel, fish? he asked out loud. My left hand is much better now and I'm feeling good. I have food now for one day and one night, so pull the boat, fish. But the truth was that the old man really did not feel so good. The pain across his back had escalated from bearing the weight of the heavy line. Now the pain had graduated into a dullness that he was very wary of, as he felt no more pain. But I have been in worse situations than this, the old man justified to himself. My left hand is almost healed now, and there is a minor cut on the right hand. My legs are in perfect condition, and now I have the upper hand in terms of food over the fish. It was the month of September, and it was normal for the sun to set quickly and darkness to arrive faster at this time of year. He rested against the bow for as long as he could afford to, and the first stars started appearing then. Soon I shall have all my distant friends for company, the old man stated as he gazed at the stars. But this fish is my friend too. But I must kill him even though he is my friend. Thank God we don't have to kill the stars. What if a man was supposed to try and kill the moon or the sun every day? What if the sun and the moon ran away like the fish? The old man thanked his stars for not having to hunt the sun, moon and the stars and felt so sorry for the fish again. But he was determined to kill it and his sympathy never interfered with his desire. He is a great fish. How many people will he feed? Will they be worthy enough to feed on his flesh? Surely not. The fish is too great and refined for any man to be worthy enough to eat his meat, he decided. Then his mind returned to more important things. The line worried him, as he could lose the fish if he lost so much line. But I am lucky that he has not used the full speed that he has at his disposal until now. He made a mental note to eat the dolphin later, to increase his strength after deciding to rest for an hour. But he rested for two hours. Well, that is what he thought as he had no way of telling how much time had elapsed. The rest was not proper, and he still felt the weight of the tug of the fish across his shoulders from time to time. If only I could make the line fast, he thought. That would make it simpler. But then he could break it with just one lurch. What I must do is cushion the line with my body all the time, and also give the line with both hands. Chapter 14. Man versus Fish The old man realised he had not slept for a long time. You must get some sleep, old man, he said aloud. Do it when the fish is quiet. Lack of sleep might make your head unclear. But I'm quite clear in the head, the old man thought. I'm as clear as my brothers, the stars that shine brightly above. But I must get some sleep. Even the stars sleep, and so do the sun and the moon. Even the oceans get some sleep on certain days when there is no current and everything is calm. I must think of a simple plan to get some sleep, as it is dangerous to go without sleep. But now I must prepare to eat the dolphin, he decided, and started to crawl towards the stern. The old man was careful not to jerk the line and disturb the fish who might have been asleep himself. But I don't want the fish to rest, he thought. He must pull till his last breath. He reached the stern to hold the weight of the line with his foot as he withdrew his knife with his right hand. He saw the dolphin clearly, thanks to the stars that shone brightly. He struck his knife inside the dead dolphin's head and dragged him out from under the stern. 
He held the fish with his foot and slit him from the vent to the base of the lower drawer as fast as he could. Then he placed his knife on the floor carefully and gutted the dolphin with his right hand. The old man scooped the dolphin clean and pulled out the gills. He slit open the stomach to discover two flying fish inside that were still fresh. He picked them up and put them aside. Then he threw the guts and the gills overboard and they sank after leaving a trail in the water. Then he skinned one side of the dolphin with his foot on the head again for better grip. He turned the dolphin over and skinned the other side after that. Then he separated both sides with his knife from the head to tail. He threw the carcass overboard and observed if there was any movement in the water. But the carcass sank silently. He placed the flying fish into the two fillets that he had made and unsheathed his knife. Then he returned to the bow, carrying his food. Exhausted with the effort and the weight of the line on his left shoulder, he washed the flying fish carefully in the water and wondered why the marlin was still immobile. Maybe he is resting, or he is just tired, the old man concluded. It's a good time for me to finish eating this dolphin and get some much-needed sleep. The old man ate the dolphin fillet and a flying fish that he had gutted. The dolphin made an excellent meal when it is cooked, he remarked, but it tastes really bad when it's raw. Remind me never to enter a boat again without carrying salt or limes. I should have splashed water on the bow throughout the day if I had any sense, and then I should have kept on drying it, he said regretfully. Then I would have made all the salt that I needed, but when I hooked the dolphin the sun was almost setting. The old man defended himself now, but I must admit that I should have been better prepared. There, I've chewed it all up now and I don't feel sick at all. Clouds were filling the sky slowly now as the stars disappeared. The wind had dropped and it appeared that the old man was being dragged by the fish into a mountain of clouds. There will be bad weather in three or four days, the old man predicted. But the good news is that I'm safe today and tomorrow. It's time to rest. The old man propped himself against the wood of the bow and lay forward on the line with his body as he held the line strongly with his right hand. He put his entire weight on his right hand to secure the line. Then he slept. The old man did not dream about the lions this time. Instead, he earlier dreamed of a big school of porpoise that was almost ten miles long and in their mating season. They would jump high in the air and then return to the same hole that they had created in the water when they had jumped. Then, the old man dreamed that he was back in his village, asleep on his bed. There was a norther blowing and he was feeling very cold, but he could not feel his right arm as it was numb. He had slept on it instead of a pillow. After that, he dreamed he was in a yellow beach that stretched out for miles. The lions started coming there and the old man was finally happy. The moon had risen long ago, but the old man was still fast asleep as the fish pulled his boat into the tunnel of clouds. The old man was awakened suddenly as his right fist struck his face and as the lion started escaping through his right hand. He could not feel his left hand anymore, but he struggled all he could with his right hand. Suddenly, his left hand gripped the lion to take all the punishment and bled badly. The fish jumped without warning, making a huge splash in the sea as it fell heavily. It kept on jumping as the boat raced ahead speedily with the line running out as well. The old man was pushed right to the breaking point as he was pulled down into the bow. He was rendered immobile with his face in the cut slice of the dolphin fillet. Chapter 15. The Circling Fish The old man could not see the fish jump, but could hear him rise and fall on the water. This is what we have been waiting for for all this time, he thought. Now the chance must be taken. I shall make him pay for the line. The old man's hands were cut badly by the line, and he was careful not to let the line cut his fingers by slipping across his palms. If only the boy was here, he thought. He would wet the coils of the line. The line had gone out rapidly earlier, but now the old man was fighting the fish hard and making him earn every inch of the line. The fish had slowed down considerably now, and the old man rose to a kneeling position by taking his head out of the dolphin fillet that his face had crushed. Then he got up on his feet slowly. He discovered that he still had plenty of line left. He has jumped so many times that he will be too tired to go down very deep to die, the old man thought. That is good, because I cannot catch him if he goes down deep. But what made him panic like that? Was the fish hungry? Did something scare him in the night? But how could such a brave, calm, confident and great fish experience fear? It is rather strange indeed. You had better be brave and confident yourself, old man, he said. He will begin to circle very soon and you better be ready. The old man held the line with his left hand using the weight of his shoulders. Then he scooped up water using his right hand to get the fishy mess off his face. Then he washed his right hand and watched the sun come up. 
he realised that the fish was headed eastward, and that indicated that he was tired as the fish was travelling with the current now. He would soon be forced to circle, and then real battle would commence. He inspected his right hand after it had been submerged in the salty water for some time, and was satisfied. It's not looking that bad, he said. Besides, a man should not feel any pain. He carefully held the line with his right hand now, and shifted his body weight to submerge his left hand in the water to soothe his wounds. For someone so useless, you did not do a bad job at all, he addressed his left hand, but you did abandon me at a crucial time. The old man regretted the fact that he had a handicap. He hadn't been born with two good hands. Maybe it's my fault for not having trained my left hand better. But he has had so many opportunities to learn. He did not perform badly in the night, mind you, as he cramped just once. But if my left hand cramps again, I hope the line cuts him off, he stated. The old man decided to chew a little more of the dolphin meat so that he could think better and clear his head. But then, consuming it would bring about nausea, and it was better to be light-headed than suffer from this in that situation. I'd better save it for an emergency situation till it goes bad, he decided. It's too late now to seek strength from food like that. Let me eat the flying fish instead. As soon as the old man had done so, the fish began to circle. The slant of the line did not indicate that the fish was circling as it was too early for that. But the old man knew this out of experience, from the particular pressure exerted by the fish on the line. He began to pull the line slowly, using both hands in a swinging movement, as well as the strength of his entire body. It's a circle that is very big, the old man exclaimed. Then, the line did not come in any more. The effort will lessen his circle each time, the old man concluded. I should be able to see him in an hour's time. I must kill him. But even after two hours, the fish continued circling and the old man was tired and sweating with his own efforts. But the circles had become shorter and the fish appeared closer to the water's surface. The old man had been seeing black spots in front of his eyes during the last hour as sweat glistened on his face, salting his eyes as well as the wounds under his eye and forehead. The black spots did not bother him, as these were common after the strain experienced on pulling the line for so long. But what was worrying was that his strength was fading away and that he felt faint and weak. I cannot fail now when I have the upper hand and die after fighting for so long, he exclaimed. Help me win, O God, and I shall say a hundred Hail Marys as well as a hundred Our Fathers, he promised. But please, I can't say them now, but think of it as done as I shall do it later. Chapter 16. The Old Man is Stretched. The old man suddenly felt a violent jerk on the line. He's banging the wire leader with his spear, he guessed. That's bound to happen. I hope he keeps circling and does not jump now. But he knew that the fish needed to make those jumps to get air. But what was worrying was that each jump caused the opening of the hook wound to widen further, and the fish could get rid of the hook soon. Please don't jump, fish, he prayed. The fish hit the wire again, and again, and each time the old man loosened a bit of the line. I mustn't allow his pain to lessen the old man thought. My own pain is not of consequence, as I can control it, but his pain could drive him mad. The fish stopped hitting the wire soon and began circling again. The old man gained some line but felt weak again. He put some water on his head and rubbed the back of his neck with his wet hand. The old man was tempted to rest for a while, but the fish was approaching the boat now, so he started bringing in all the line that he had gained by pulling, pivoting and weaving. I feel much better now the old man said. I know I'm tired, but I shall rest later when he goes out on his next turn. Then I shall get him after two or three turns, he resolved. The trade wind will soon rise to the maximum, and I need that to bring in the fish. The fish turned and the old man sat down on the bow with a fierce pull on the line. He saw that the sea had risen quite a bit, and there was a pleasant breeze in the air. I'll need that to return home, he thought. All I have to do is steer south and west. It is a long island and a man is never lost at sea here. The old man had his first proper glimpse of the fish at the third turn. The dark shadow of the fish took a long time to pass under the boat. The old man could not believe his own eyes. No, he exclaimed, surely he isn't that huge. But the fact was that the fish was gigantic and as he ended the circle he was making now he emerged on the surface almost 30 yards away from the boat. The old man saw his lavender-coloured tail extend over the surface of the blue water. The tail was higher than the biggest scythe blade, and as the fish passed by, the old man saw his massive body in purple stripes. The dorsal fin faced downwards, and the big pectorals were spread out. He had a view of the fish's eye as well, and the two grey sucking fish that accompanied the monster, who were three feet long each. 
They swam around him, sometimes clinging to his body, sometimes swimming independently, and sometimes content to swim in his shadow, lashing their bodies around like eels. The old man started sweating profusely now, but it was not the sun that made him sweat this time. With every turn the fish made, he was gaining line, and the old man was positive that he would get the chance to harpoon it soon. In two more turns, perhaps. But I must wait till he is really, really close, he decided. Then I must aim carefully. I mustn't aim for the head, and I must pierce his heart. You need to be calm and brave, old man, he said to himself in an encouraging manner. The next circle saw the fish's back exposed, but he was a long distance away from the boat. The circle after that saw the fish still further away, but this time he was way out of the water. I'm sure I can have him alongside my boat if I can manage to gain some more line, the old man thought. He had already rigged his harpoon, and the light coil of the harpoon rested in a round basket with the end attached to the bit in the bow. The fish made a circle now and approached the boat silently and calmly, with only his tail showing signs of movement. He was resplendent in his beauty, and the old man pulled with all his experience and skill in an attempt to get him closer. The fish turned on his side momentarily and then began to circle again after straightening himself. I've moved him, the old man exclaimed, as he held on to the fish despite all his tiredness. Maybe I can get him finally. Pull, hands, help me, legs, think for me, head. I'll pull him over this time. But despite his best efforts, the fish only came alongside the boat, pulled over and swam away even as the old man pulled with all his strength. You have to die anyway, fish, the old man exclaimed. Why do you want to kill me as well? His mouth was parched with thirst, but he could not reach out for his water bottle. I cannot survive any more of his turns, the old man confessed. I must get him now. Of course you can, he said to himself. You can take many more turns. You are the best. The old man nearly had the fish on the next turn, but he eluded the old man again and swam away slowly. You have made up your mind to kill me now, fish, the old man stated. You have every right to do that, of course. I have never seen a calmer, greater, nobler, braver fish, or one who is as beautiful as you are, my brother, he complimented the fish. Well, go ahead and kill me now. I do not care any more who kills whom now. Your head is all muddled up now, the old man said to himself. It is important that you manage to clear your head. You should learn to endure pain like a real man, or even a fish for that matter. Clear up, head he ordered, in a voice that was almost inaudible. Clear up right now. Chapter 17. Harpooned. The fish made two more turns after that, and twice it was the same story. Each time the old man felt a sense of defeat and thought of giving up. I must try once again, he thought determinedly, each time. But his hands were not strong enough, and he was having problems with his vision. The old man tried again but failed, and yet he tried one more time. He combined all his pain, pride, and whatever remained of his strength and battled the fish with it. The fish was in pain as well and swam gently by the side of the boat now, his bill making contact with the planking of the skiff. The fish passed the boat, unmistakable in his huge, infinite body and branded with purple stripes. It almost seemed endless in the water. The old man dropped the line and held it with his foot as he lifted the harpoon as high as he could. Then he drove the harpoon down on the side of the fish's body with as much strength as he could muster. He chose the spot that was just behind the huge chest fin that rose high enough to be level with his own chest now. He could feel the iron of the harpoon plunge in and he rested his own body weight to drive it in further. Then he pushed his full body weight behind it as well. The fish came alive suddenly. It was as if approaching death had roused him from his slumber. He jumped out of the water, displaying his full length, width, power and beauty. It appeared that he was in a state of momentary suspension in the air above the old man in his boat. Then he fell back into the water with a resounding splash that sent water spraying all over, drenching the old man in his boat. Although the old man was weakened extremely and could not see properly, he managed to clear the harpoon line and allowed it to run slowly through his bruised hands. He could see the fish now. He was lying on the water with his silvery belly protruding upwards. The harpoon shaft struck out from an angle from the fish's shoulder and the red of the blood that oozed out of the heart mingled with the blue of the sea that was a mile deep. As the blood spread slowly in the water, the fish lay silently, floating amidst the waves slowly. I must ensure that my head is clear, the old man whispered. I've managed to kill this fish, which is my brother. Now I must do some hard work. I must prepare the nooses as well as the rope to pull him alongside the skiff, as it will never hold such a huge fish, he decided. After I do that, I must sail home. 
The old man started pulling the fish in so that he could pass a line through the gills that would emerge from his mouth and fasten his head to the bow of the skiff. He would need two nooses, one to go around his tail and the other to go around his middle and attach him to the skiff. Not only do I wish to see him, the old man thought, but I want to touch him and feel him as he is my treasure. I have also felt his heart as I drove the harpoon into his body. You'd better get to work, old man. There is a lot of hard work left now, and the battle is finally over. He examined the sky carefully, and then stared at the fish. It couldn't be more than a little afternoon, he guessed. The trade wind is on the rise as well. The lines don't matter now. The boy and I will splice them when I reach home. But he could not pull over the fish, and so the boat had to go to the fish instead. When the old man had secured the fish finally to the side of the skiff, he was astonished at the sheer size of the fish. He had turned a complete silver now from his original colour of purple and silver, and the stripes were wider than a human hand, and a pale violet like the tail. The eyes of the fish looked as aloof as those of a saint in procession and resembled the mirrors of a periscope. It was the only way I could kill him, the old man justified the act. He was feeling much better than before, and his head had cleared completely. The fish weighs more than 1,500 pounds, he guessed. How much will that be if he dresses out two-thirds of that at 30 cents to a pound? He wondered and decided that he needed a pencil to calculate it, as his head was not completely clear for such a difficult calculation. I think I would have made even the great DiMaggio proud today, he thought. I had no bone spurs, but my hands and my back took a terrible beating. But I wonder what a bone spur is, actually. Maybe I have it without even really knowing it. After he had secured the fish to the side of the skiff, the old man realised that it was actually like tying up a bigger boat alongside. He cut off a piece of the line and tied the fish's lower jaw against his bill, so that the fish wouldn't bang against the boat when they set sail and for the sailing to be smooth. Then he fixed the mast on the skiff with the stick that served as his gaff. With his boom rigged he drew the patched sail and the boat began its journey homewards as he was headed southwest. Chapter 18. Enter the Mako Shark. The old man was experienced enough not to require a compass to determine where the southwest was. All he needed was the trade wind blowing and the drawing of the sail. He also decided to pull out a small line with a spoon on it to catch something to eat and drink for the moisture. But he could not find a spoon, and the sardines had turned rotten, so he fished out some yellow gulf weed with his gaff as they passed the boat and shook out the small shrimps in it. More than a dozen shrimps fell off, jumping and kicking about on the floor of the skiff. The old man used his thumb and forefinger to pinch their heads off from their bodies and ate up the shells and tails. He chewed them slowly, and although they were tiny, he knew that they tasted good and were nutritious. He still had two drinks of water left in the bottle, and he consumed half a drink after eating the shrimps. His skiff was sailing decently despite his problems, and he was steering it with the tiller under his arm. It was not a dream, he realised, as he looked at the fish by the side of his skiff. He had caught the fish. He kept looking at the fish to make sure that it was not an illusion. He hoped that his hands would be healed soon by the waters of the gulf, which had proven to be great healers before. Then, his head starting acting funny again, he thought, Am I bringing in the fish, or is he bringing me in? If the fish were in the skiff, there would be no doubt that he was bringing him in but they were in reality sailing side by side together. The old man tried to keep his head clear and not think about such things as he steered the boat. Watching the clouds, he was certain that the breeze would last through the night. It was only an hour before the first shark would attack him. The shark did not merely come across him by chance. In fact, he had followed the trail of blood left behind by the fish, picked up the scent of the boat and followed it. There were times when the shark would lose the scent and then pick it up again. The shark swam furiously towards the origin of the scent, and he was the fastest fish in the sea. He was a well-built mako shark, and apart from being exceptionally speedy, he was a lovely creature to look at. Everything about him was beautiful, with the sole exception of his jaws. He had a blue back, just like the swordfish, a silver belly, and a sleek and good-looking hide. He swam just below the surface with his jaws shut tightly, and with his high dorsal fin slicing through the water like a knife goes through butter. He possessed eight rows of teeth that slanted inwards cruelly within the closed double lip of his jaws, but these teeth were quite unlike the normal pyramid-shaped teeth that most sharks possessed. Instead, the mako shark's teeth were shaped somewhat like a man's fingers, but were sharpened like claws. The shark's teeth were almost as long as the fingers of the old man and featured razor-sharp cutting edges on both sides. He was a fish that had been created 
to feed on all the fish that existed in the sea and had no enemy or rival underwater because of the fact that he was so powerful and well armed. The shark increased his speed as the scent grew stronger and fresh. The old man saw him approach and knew at once that this shark was totally fearless and would do whatever he wanted to do. The old man prepared the harpoon but realised that the rope was a little short as he had cut away some of it to tie the fish to the skiff. The old man's head had totally cleared, and he was more resolute than before, although he harboured very little hope now. He looked at the fish dangling by the side of the skiff and sighed. Well, it was too good to last anyway, he declared, as he took one last look at the fish. I cannot stop him from hitting me, but maybe I have a chance as well, the old man thought, as the shark closed in on the boat. The shark hit the fish and the old man saw his jaws open wide and bite off a huge chunk of meat just above the tail. He heard the clicking sound of the shark's teeth and the sound of the fish's flesh being ripped apart. He harpooned the shark with great force right between the eyes. That was the precise location of the shark's brain and the old man had managed to hit the spot with his first attempt. He hit the shark without any hope but with complete resolution and fearlessness. The old man knew that the shark was almost dead but the shark had not come to terms with his fate. The shark skimmed across the water on his back, wrapped in two loops of rope just like a speedboat, with his jaws snapping furiously and his tail lashing out savagely. The water turned white where his lashing tail made contact and three-fourths of his body was above the surface when the rope broke at last. The shark lay quietly on the water and the old man observed him silently. Then he went to examine the damage. He took about forty pounds of the fish as well as my harpoon and rope, he exclaimed. He has also made my fish bleed, and soon the blood will attract the other predators of the sea. The old man was sad that the fish had been mangled. It was as if himself had been hit. But I have killed that shark that attacked my fish, the old man stated proudly. He was one of the biggest I have ever seen. But then, a man has not been able to accept defeat. He can be completely destroyed, but never defeated. But bad times are about to come, as sharks are intelligent creatures. I was more intelligent than this shark, as I was armed, but I don't have my harpoon to defend myself now. The old man tried to distract his mind by thinking about baseball and DiMaggio, and then he attached his knife to one of the oars. He was not unarmed now. Perhaps it was a sin to kill the fish, he thought as he sailed on, but I did that to survive, and so that many of my people could be fed, he reasoned. Besides, isn't everything in life a sin? You think too much, old man. You were born to be a fisherman, and the fish were born to be a fish. But he had enjoyed killing the shark, though he had killed it in self-defence. Chapter 19. More Sharks The old man leaned over and pulled loose a piece of fish the shark had bitten off and ate it, relishing the taste. It was quality meat and would fetch the highest price in the market. But how would he stop the scent from travelling across the water? Bad times were coming soon. The old man couldn't spot a boat or a ship or even a bird in the distance. He could only see flying fish and the yellow patches of gulfweed. He had travelled for almost two hours when he suddenly saw the first shark. Then he saw the second fin raised behind the first. The old man picked up the oar with the knife attached to it and his hands hurt from the effort. The sharks closed in slowly. These were evil sharks that hunted to kill and their hunger often drove them to chew off the oars of a boat or bite the rudder. These sharks did not approach the boat like the Mako. They worked as a team. One of them went under the skiff and pulled on the fish as the old man felt the entire boat shake. The others just watched the old man with slit-like yellow eyes. Then he charged at the fish where he had already been bitten. The old man picked up the oar and drove the knife right into the eyes of the shark and swallowed a mouthful of fish as he died when he went under the water. The other shark was threatening to destroy the boat now as he pulled at the fish. The old man swung the skiff broadside so that the shark came out from under it. He leaned over and punched the shark with an oar. But he made contact with the tough hide and the knife did not enter the skin. The blow had injured his hand and his shoulder. The shark came up now and his head was above the water. The old man stabbed him twice in the centre of his head as the shark reached for the fish. Then, as the old man pulled out the blade and punched the shark at the same spot again, the shark suddenly hung on to the fish with his jaws locked on it, and the old man stabbed him in the left eye now, but the shark still wouldn't let go. The old man slammed the knife between the vertebrae and the brain and felt the cartilage separate. Then he shoved the oar with the knife right into the shark's jaws to open them. He twisted the blade till the shark loosened his grip and fell into the depths of the sea. Go and join your friend a mile below, the old man said. Maybe she's your mother. The old man wiped the blade of his knife clean and rested the oar. Then he sailed the skiff to resume its journey again. 
Those two took a quarter of the fish's meat, and it was the best meat as well, the old man reflected. I wish I hadn't caught him in the first place. I shouldn't have gone out so far, fish. I am sorry for both of us. The old man was aware that the way the fish had been butchered by those two sharks would only attract the attention of other predators, but he was more concerned to get his hands in shape again so that he could defend what remained of his fish. The fish would have lasted the man a whole winter. The next shark came was a shovel nose, and the old man pierced his brain as he hit the fish, but as the shark fell backward dead and rolled over, the knife blade snapped in two. The old man steered his boat and did not even bother to watch the shark sink into the water. The sight had always fascinated him, but now he was too disturbed to watch. I only have a gaff now to defend myself, he thought, but it will be useless. There were also the oars, the short club and the tiller, but it was impossible for even the strongest of men to club sharks to death, and he was just an old man. He desperately hoped that he would sight land soon. The sharks hit him again only at sunset as they approached the skiff, swimming side by side. He picked up the club, which was basically an oar handle from a broken oar that had been sawed off to about two and a half feet. There were two sharks and he hit the first one on the head as he bit the fish. He felt solid rubber as he made contact, but he also felt the bone and smashed down the club across the nose. The shark let go of the fish and sunk into the water. The other shark came near him now, with his mouth spilling over with the fish's meat, and the old man clubbed him hard on the head. The shark stared at him, and the old man hit him repeatedly. Then the shark attacked and the old man raised the club high again and hit him as hard as he could. This time he made contact with the bone at the base of the brain and chose the same spot for his next hit. The shark moved away. The old man waited, but the sharks didn't return. Then he spotted one swimming in circles above the surface. I could never have hoped to kill them, the old man thought, but the fact that I have injured them and scared them away is enough. He did not want to inspect the fish, as he knew that half of the fish had been mutilated already. The sun had set, and he hoped to see the glow of Havana as darkness descended. That would guide him home. Chapter 20 Home Sweet Home The old man was confident he wasn't far from home, as nobody had been worried about him enough to look for him. The boy would have worried, as well as a few old fishermen, but on second thought, he was sure there were many who were worried, as he lived in a good village full of good people. He apologised to the fish again and wondered what he might have done to the sharks had he been alive. That spear on his head wasn't a decoration after all. I should have cut off his bill and used it as a weapon against the sharks, the old man thought. But there was nothing with which he could chop the bill. What shall I do if they come again in the night, the old man wondered. And then he made up his mind, I shall fight them till the death. He was too exhausted to say the prayers he had promised to say if he caught the fish. After thinking aloud a lot of nonsense, he tried to make himself comfortable in the great pain that he was in as he steered the boat. Suddenly, the old man spotted the reflection of the glare of the city lights around ten o'clock at night. The lights were only a distant blur initially, just like the hazy light in the sky before the moon rises. Then they gradually became clearer, and he steered towards the warmth of the glow. It's all over now, the old man thought in relief but the sharks will attack again in all probability. But what am I to do without a weapon to defend myself? He found it hard to move and his entire body hurt with the wounds he had suffered and the biting cold made him shiver. The old man prayed he would not have to fight again, but he fought at midnight when they arrived in a pack. Despite clubbing their heads, the sharks moved under the skiff and he could feel the boat shake wildly. Then his club was captured by a pair of jaws and it disappeared. He detached the tiller from the rudder and fought wildly with it now, but the sharks tore off all the flesh from the fish's body. The old man swung the tiller with all his might again and again till he heard it break. He attacked with the splintered butt now, and the shark retreated as he was pierced. But the sharks did not return again, as there was nothing left for them to eat now. The old man found that he had difficulty breathing, and there was a strange sweet coppery taste in his mouth. He was frightened, but there was not too much of it. He spat in the sea and cursed the sharks. Eat that and dream that you've killed a real man, he shouted. But the old man knew that the sharks had beaten him, and he set sail again using whatever remained of the tiller to steer the boat. He did not pay attention as the sharks nibbled at the fish's carcass and diverted all his attention to steering the boat home safely. Thank God she is not harmed, he said of the boat as he sailed expertly and smoothly. He spotted the lights of the beach colonies along the shore and knew he was in safe territory. Nothing compared to the feeling of reaching home safe and sound. The wind is our friend, just like the sea, he thought and added, sometimes. The great sea has our friends as well as our enemies, but right now my bed is my only friend. The old man thought as he navigated his boat into the harbour. 
There were no lights on the terrace and everyone was fast asleep. There was no one to aid him, so he pulled his boat alone and secured it to a rock. Unstepping the mast, he unfurled the sail and tied it. Then, as he climbed the mast, he realised how tired he was when his legs refused to move. He looked back to spot the reflection of the great tail of the fish standing erect in the lights. Backbone was white and nude, and so were the head and the bill. He somehow climbed to the top where he fell down holding the mast. He could not get up and lay there staring at the road. A car passed by. After five minutes, the old man resumed his journey and reached his shack in another five minutes. He sipped some water and lay down in his bed. In the morning, the old man was still fast asleep when the boy peeped in. The boy discovered that the old man was still breathing, but he started crying when he saw the old man's hands. He went outside to fetch some coffee and cried all the way. A crowd of fishermen had assembled around the skiff as one of them was measuring the skeleton with a line. How is he? One of the fishermen yelled out at the boy. He's asleep, the boy replied, not really caring that they could see him in tears. No one should disturb him, he ordered. He was eighteen feet from head to tail, the fisherman measuring the skeleton called out. I believe you, the boy replied, and headed to the terrace to order a coffee can, hot with plenty of milk and sugar. Do you need anything more? the proprietor asked kindly. Not now, the boy replied. I shall see what he can eat later. What a fish, the proprietor exclaimed. No one has ever caught such a fish. But the fish you caught yesterday weren't bad either. Damn my fish, the boy exclaimed and burst into tears. Do you want a drink? No, tell them not to disturb Santiago. I'll be back. Please tell him I'm very sorry, the proprietor said. Thanks, the boy replied and made his way back with the coffee. He waited patiently till the old man woke and gave him the coffee to drink. They beat me, Manolin, the old man exclaimed. The fish didn't beat you, the boy replied. No, but they beat me later. Pedrico is taking care of the gear and the skiff. What do you want to do with the head? The boy inquired. Ask him to chop it up. It can be used for fish traps, the old man replied. The spear? You can have it if you want. I do, the boy replied. Now we must plan for other things. Did they look for me? The old man asked. Yes, of course, the boy said. Right from the coast guard to the plains. The sea is too big and the skiff is too small to see, the old man stated. I missed you. Tell me what you caught. One each on the first and second day and two on the third day, the boy replied. That's very good. We must fish together again, the boy said. I don't think I'm lucky enough. To hell with luck. I'll carry luck. But what will your family say? I don't care, really. We must fish together as I have to learn a lot. We must carry a good killing lance all the time, the old man stated. You can create the blade from the spring leaf of an old ford and grind it into the guanabacoa. It must be sharp yet not tempered enough to break. My knife broke. I'll do the needful, Manolin said. You just get your hands well, old man. The boy urged the old man to lie down and wait while he got him something to eat. The old man requested him to get any of the old newspapers that he had missed. As the boy left and walked down the road, he was crying again. That same afternoon, a party of tourists had gathered at the terrace. A woman spotted a huge white spine with a large tail that the wind lifted and swung with the tide. What is that? she inquired of a waiter. A shark, the waiter replied before he could explain further. The woman spoke again. I was not aware that sharks possess such lovely, beautifully formed tails. Me neither, her male companion added. Just up the road, the old man was asleep in his shack with the boy sitting and watching him. The old man was dreaming about the lions.